Our selection today is Grocery, the Buying and Selling of Food in America by best-selling author Michael Ruhlman. Ruhlman's con commentary provides insights into the world of supermarkets and the ways in which we produce, consume, and distribute food. Our reviewer is urban economist Glenn Kellogg. A principal with the Portland, Oregon-based company Urban Advisors, Kellogg is also the manager of Rochester Local Capital, a company that provides venture, venture capital and management services to launch businesses that create walkable neighborhoods in Rochester. It was his vision to bring hearts to Rochester. Partnering with local investors, he managed <laughs> He managed the launch of Hearts, Rochester's popular downtown grocery store. Please join me in welcoming Glenn Kellogg. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Glenn Kellogg. I have never done a book review before. Uh, so I will, I will begin with talking about myself. <laughs> I'm Glenn Kellogg. Uh, I am an urban economist by trade, and that's really been my profession for the last Oh, decade or so. Um, this is a picture of me in a new store in Washington, D.C. It's not my store, but, uh, but I, I kind of like it. We, uh, I moved from Washington, D.C. Um, that's where I met my wife. I was practicing urban economics there. And when she quit her job in D.C. and moved into our two-bedroom condo, it got really crowded. And uh, we were both working out of a small space, and she was ready to kill me. So we needed more space, and we needed to move someplace. And um, DC was very, very expensive, and we were looking for other opportunities to maybe really get involved in a community that we lived in. So she's from Rochester, and we came up, checked it out, and thought, found what a wonderful community. There's a real great opportunity to get involved in, uh, get involved here, and, and make things better. And so here we are, and um, somehow I got involved in this project. This is my store. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the project that I started um, several years ago. Uh, I saw that there was an opportunity. I, I came at this from the urban economics perspective of understanding that there was an opportunity for, uh, for an unmet demand in downtown that would help provide a walkable community for downtown. So, uh, so I got involved in this project, which I think is why today I've been asked to review this book. <laughs> think. So now let me um, tell you about Michael Ruhlman, who I've never met and do not know anything about. Um, but uh, he, he's on the left with Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> um, this is the part where uh, I think the best thing to do is read from the dust jacket. Michael Ruhlman is the author of critically acclaimed books, including The Soul of a Chef, The Elements of Cooking, Ratio, Ruhlman's 20, and Egg. He's collaborated on several best-selling cookbooks, including the French laundry cookbook, Bouchon and Aliena. He has written about food and cooking for the New York Times, Gourmet, Food Arts, and other publications. You can find him online at ruhlman.com and at ruhlman on Twitter and Instagram. He lives in New York City. Um, but I believe he really became famous for uh, what he mentioned there, writing with Thomas Keller of the French laundry. There's a tie-in on that, too. Um, Hearts uses the Thomas Keller recipe for our chocolate chip cookies. So this is the book, um, Grocery, The Buying and Selling of Food in America. Um, and as has been said, it's an investigation of the grocery industry in, with particular attention to the relationships between sources, retailers, and customers. So this book traces the history and modern operations of a chain in Cleveland called uh, Heinen's. They're a small chain in the hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, where Roman grew up. And uh, the book also includes not just a few well-leveled, well-argued rants, which I will share some, some of with you. So fundamentally in this book, he's describing how we have become distanced from the origins of our food. Um, and also, the book is a tribute to his father, which I, will, I would like to read just a short passage from the first page. Rip Ruhlman loved to eat, almost more than anything else. We'd be tucking into the evening's meal when he'd ask, with excitement in his eyes, what should we have for dinner tomorrow? Used to drive mom crazy. And because he loved to eat, my father loved grocery stores. Skipping a little. Mom went back to work once I started kindergarten. And I don't recall her ever setting foot in a grocery store through the rest of their 22-year marriage. 
That was my father's territory. And to my father, grocery stores were the land of opportunity. <laughs> so this is the, uh, a historic photo of Heinen's in Shaker Heights where uh, Rip Rollman used to buy his groceries before it was redeveloped later. Um, but in, I'd like to describe this store as well a few pages later. In 1933, Joe Heinen opened what the company says was Cleveland's first supermarket near the intersection of Chagrin, Chagrin? Meh. <laughs> <laughs> Boulevard on, on Lee Road, one block from the streetcar, bisecting Shaker Heights. Here he had enough space to sell meat and fish, groceries, canned and boxed goods, dairy, milk, eggs, butter and cheese, and produce that he would buy daily at Cleveland's food terminal downtown, where all the other green grocers bought their fruits and vegetables. Hmm, sounds familiar. In fact, a lot of this sounds familiar. This is a historic photo of, uh, of a Hart's local grocers that I think looks pretty similar. Um, this was a, a common phenomenon in America. It used to be, uh, at, at, th at this period of time in grocery history, there was a change that um, Michael Roman talks a little bit about in here, uh, where we moved from small corner stores like this one, where you went in to the, uh, to the counter and you asked somebody to get the can of tuna down from the shelf for you, and then they packaged it up and, and uh, and served you from the counter to the self-service model that we know today. In fact, Hartz was a pioneer in shifting from this model into the self-service model, and Heinen's came on the scene right about that time uh, of developing the self-service model. And in fact, um, Heinen's claims credit for uh, being the first self-service meat counter. Ruin goes on to describe the uh, to very quickly describe the history of the, uh, of the supermarket, of moving from the, uh, the small streetcar suburb shop to, um, this is the Heinen's and Shaker Heights today. I took this off Google Maps. I thought it g gave a little bit better context than their, uh, than their stock photography. Um, it, it's a little bit different environment. With this, I'd like to read um, Ruhlman's summary. Of, uh, of this transformation. Page before. I'm gonna take some liberty editing and jumping back and, back and forth to make this hold together and not read everything to make it, bear with me. Okay, In, after World War II, America entered its economic boom years. Its gross domest domestic product would quintuple from a post-war 100 billion to 515 billion by the end of the 1950s. White flight had begun, and middle class families were moving out of cities in large numbers, something that was possible because of the ubiquity of the automobile and the great swaths of undeveloped land surrounding most cities. The Grandview Avenue Shopping Center, built in 1928 outside Columbus, Ohio, was apparently the first, quote, shopping center in the United States to include parking in its design. But now, with booming populations on plentiful land, real estate developers could create large complexes of stores with oceans of, of parking space. In these new spaces, grocery stores could expand to 10 to 20 times the size they were when they occupied stores built in shopping areas that had been created to accommodate foot traffic and streetcar lines. One of the under-recognized facts of American real estate development is how our modes of transportation are the fundamental determiners of the way we create our residential and commercial spaces. You can leave it to me to find that quote in here. The advent of the streetcar, as previously noted, brought about the creation of America's first suburbs, with sidewalks and shopping districts within walking distance in the, first in the first and second decades of the 19th century. Spaces that were developed after the automobile became a predominant feature of the American life are far from city centers and spread out. It was the automobile and highways that led to suburban sprawl, and as the highway system grew, America created even more sprawling exurbs and office complexes centered around interchange cloverleafs. From 1948 to 1963, large chains increased their share of the nation's grocery business from 35% to almost half. Here he's um, quoting Harvey Levenstein in Paradox of Plenty. As early as 1956, the independent grocery, store, grocery corner store, while still visible, was a relic of the past. 
Full-fledged supermarkets accounted for 62% of the nation's grocery sales, while smaller self-service superettes took in another 28% of the food dollar, leaving the 212,000 small food stores to share 10% of the market. The 3,000 square foot store became 30,000 square feet on its march through the 1960s and 70s towards the huge supermarkets of today, which can measure up to 90,000 square feet or more if you're Wegmans. The current ideal size for Heinen's stores is 40,000 square feet. This store, incidentally, is only 45,000 square feet. Um, plenty big enough for all they sell, but not so huge that you feel the need for a golf cart to, na to navigate it. So tying back to something else that he says, at precisely the same time that the American economy swelled and middle class families moved to the suburbs in large numbers, the major food manufacturers came into their own and begun to dominate the American food scene. Markets for processed foods exploded after World War II, according to the Oxford Handbook for Food History, as food manufacturing became a powerful industrial sector in its own right. Food processing and manufacturing industries devised many new standardized food products, including packaged and frozen foods, turning commodity crops such as soy, maize, and wheat into inputs for industrial production. These food companies heavily marketed their packages of processed corn, wheat, sugar, and salt products in seemingly infinite permutations, all with the promise of making life easier for the housewife. As more women began to work outside the home, convenience became the main marketing lever food companies and advertisers used to sell their products. Quote, cooking is a chore, let us do the work for you, was the overriding message of Jell-O instant pudding and Betty Crocker cake mix. So there are about 23 store, well, there are 23 stores between Ohio and, uh, I'm sorry, there are 23 Heinen's grocery stores between Ohio and Illinois and with, uh, with regional warehouses. One of the things that, that I think um, Ruhlman doesn't really get into is he's, he's leaving the, some dots on here that he's not quite connecting. I'd like to tie them in for you. So you can see, uh, I don't know if you can really see on this slide, but uh, uh, the stores are spread out across the, uh, across the region in uh, different communities. You, it looks like they're um, maybe 10 miles apart. I made a similar um, map of 1939 Rochester, and you can see the different scale they were talking about. At this time in 1939 in Rochester, Hearts had over 100 locations, and you can see how tightly together they were. The point of this is, there, is the changing business model of, um, of grocery that, uh, that I don't think Ruhlman quite, is less interested or didn't tie the pieces together well in this book. Of the different business models, and this is what I consult on, so I'm ready to talk about this, <laughs> and, and give you some context that in, um, in small, uh, in downtowns and in streetcar suburbs, you have higher densities of people and higher densities of intersections and things are just closer together. So if you're, store, if you're going to base a store on 10,000 people, 10,000 people live in a closer radius in a city than they do once you get out to the suburbs. Now, when you look out at the suburbs at that 10,000 people, it's you, instead of you needing a half mile radius, you need maybe a five mile radius to capture that number of people. And in fact, once you've done that, people have so much choice uh, that you're already in a car and driving somewhere, you're no longer even competing on convenience of neighbors around you, you're really having to compete on a much larger scale, and so bigger is better. That you, the utility of the trip starts to matter, and you need to stock every single variety of every item that anyone might possibly want to buy. And it's fundamentally a different business model. Likewise, there's another uh, subtle shift in this that goes with that goes with that same transportation in the way where it, that that same shift in the way we're um, selling groceries and getting groceries to those stores. I want to come back and remind you that the uh, you may not be able to see it on the screen, but in the center there, where the where the flag is, that's their central warehouse distribution center that serves, uh, they, they produce much of the prepared food and, um, and a, it's the hub for all of the Wegman stores in the Cleveland region. You might recognize something similar from where we mentioned that uh, Heinen 
originally bought his green grocers at the, uh, at the market terminal. We have one of those. But it's kind of different than it was in the past. Now, uh, the public market is mostly geared towards retail sales. But in the past, public markets were where grocery, they were those warehouses for all of the local stores. Uh, that they would go and buy green groceries and, their, and uh, wholesale at, at the public market. And it's changed today. With those warehouses, um, Ruhlman takes us to Expo West, where deals are cut between national producers and small and medium-sized chains. Um, Hearts attends the less, prestige, less prestigious Expo East in Baltimore. But um, this is a, a, a change in the way, um, instead of going to our local market, we go to a national convention center to buy the things that go in the center of the store. Even, even if they're uh, still natural and uh, um, organic products, it's a very different relationship. And it's a different way, it's a very different business model for sourcing um, what goes into that store. Roman um, argues that uh, grocers sell products because customers buy them. He's right. They often feel beholden to the market and have to offer goods, especially commodities like Cheerios, at their very best price. So this system makes it hard to provide local, seasonal, and healthy foods. And Ruhlman argues that grocery stores are also the best agents of change in the system. Because at Expo West, Heinen's has terrific buying power with its 23 stores. Um, as he tells the story, when they're walking through uh, the, the vendors and um, the vendors hear what kind of buying power they have, they start doubling over and are really accommodating. That uh, 23 stores is a, a big size chain. You can, uh, you can start affecting, and this, this is the point, that gives them leverage to push producers to provide the kind of things they think their customers will buy. I didn't find a good transition for this slide. <laughs> so I'm just going to jump in and read a, uh, another short passage, because I've ranted myself long enough here. And we are up to it. So this is, in this part of the book, Roman starts to talk about health and uh, how what we eat is killing us. I was standing in line at an independent store in my neighborhood with my La Croix orange sparkling water, some hamburger buns, a bag of chips, a couple of bottles of wine, last minute purchases for dinner. In front of me was a middle-aged woman dressed in business clothes, loading up the conveyor belt. She set a carton of Land of Lakes, fat-free, half and half, on the conveyor belt. I paused and thought, no, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but I couldn't help myself. Half and half is defined by its fat content, about 10%, more than milk, less than cream, I had to ask. Excuse me, can I ask you why you're buying fat free half and half? A bit startled to be put on the spot by a stranger, she recovered enough to say, uh, because it's fat free? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think they replaced the fat with, I asked. Hmm, she said lifting the carton and reading the second ingredient on the label after skim milk. Corn syrup? She frowned at me, then set the carton back on the conveyor belt and scanned along with the rest of the, her groceries. The woman apparently hadn't even thought to ask herself the question. Rather, she accepted the common belief that fat, an essential part of our diet, should be avoided whenever possible. Then again, why should she question it, given that we allow the food companies, the advertisers, and food researchers to do all of our thinking for us? The encounter crystallized many issues for me about the nature of our food and the nature of the people buying that food, and how food companies, nutritionists, doctors, and governmental recommendations influence the way we buy. And frankly, it drives me a little crazy. So he goes on to um, interview a couple of doctors who feature prominently in the rest of the book. And I'm um, not sure if I should do a reading. Yes, if it's short. Jump to another good doctor part. How many of us in the, how many of us use the word healthy, for instance, to describe food or our meals? Do we stop to consider what this means? Eat healthy food, we are continually told. I submit to you that our beloved cow salads are not 
quote, healthy, and that we are confusing ourselves by believing that they are. Because cow salads are not in themselves healthy. They are certainly nutritious, and they may be delicious when prepared well. And the cow itself, while in the ground, may have been a healthy crop. But the kale on your plate is not healthy, and to describe it as such obscures what is most important about that cow salad, that it's packed with nutrients your body needs. This is not strictly about semantics. If you ate kale, you would become, if, if, you, if all you ate was kale, you would become sick. Semantics, rather, shows us where to begin. Healthy is a bankrupt word, Dr. School said. Our food isn't healthy. We are healthy. Our food is nutritious. I'm all about words. Words are the key to giving people the tools they need to figure out what to eat. Everyone is so confused. Um, and I think that confusion is what he describes in uh, most of the middle of the book of uh, how, how we have been confused about, uh, about food. So in this section, um, there's a, uh, a second doctor who shows up, Dr. Todd. Dr. Todd is a Heinen's employee, and he is their uh, wellness consultant. This section discusses how wellness, the whole, also this section discusses how the whole wellness um, center of a store is a response to our unhealthy eating habits. Um, we're seeing pills and supplements, we're, we're eating pills and supplements to correct ailments from things that we eat. So um, this guy is Dr. Todd, he's a naturalist doctor, uh, and in fact somewhere he describes himself as an Appalachian root doctor. I think you can kind of get that from, from him. So he's featured in this book. He's got his own book on healthy eating. And Dr. Todd describes in this book how changing our diets to avoid food that is processed and stripped of nutrients can improve our health naturally. Um, and he says, the key is local and seasonal. Hmm. So this moves on towards the end of the book where one of the Heinen brothers who still operates the store uh, is talking, is, is asked about the future of grocery. Oh, and uh, Dr. Todd also suggests, one of the things I forgot on there, Dr. Todd also suggests that in the future of grocery um, are places like Heinen's, places that are trying to sell local seasonal uh, products that, are, that, are, that have not been stripped of their nutritional value. Um, places like what Hartz is trying to do. Joe Heinen, though, uh, talk, uh, Jeff Heinen talks about uh, one of the two brothers who currently run, run the Heinen's chain, talks about what the future of grocery looks like. And he believes that it's smaller, that grocery stores will be getting smaller. And if Amazon has their way, he says that um, the entire center of the store will just be delivered automatically to your doorstep, and that grocery stores will become more like specialty stores focusing on the perimeter of the fresh and prepared uh, fruits and vegetables and, um, and, and meats around the perimeter of the store. Um, incidentally, this is a picture of a uh, Heinen store in Hudson, Ohio, that I visited as I was researching um, stores for hearts. It's only about 20,000 square feet in, in a small town. That's incidentally about the same size as hearts. And inside looks kind of familiar. So the book concludes with Heinen's newest location. Heinen's just opened a store, maybe you've heard about it, downtown. In February 2015, uh, they opened their first downtown location. This was only a couple of months after Hearts opened in Rochester. We opened in August 2014. They opened in February 2015. And they moved in. They were um, asked by the developer to move in to a, uh, a downtown bank building. It's pretty remarkable, hmm? Uh, that would have been a fun place to design a grocery store. It's, uh, it ends up being sort of a, a literal temple of food. Um, again, though, this is one of the places where in describing this, um, there's conversation about the residents moving back in to downtown, 
but Ruhlman doesn't really, he, he isn't really as interested in connecting the dots on this landscape, that just as people moved away from downtowns in, uh, through the 50s, through the 70s, they're now moving back. And the conclusion that he doesn't quite get to is that that's changing retail in the same way. Well, in, the, in an opposite way, in a new way. Meanwhile, here are some pictures of the new downtown Heinens. Um, this is the, uh, they had some difficulty with a round circular area of how to turn that into, um, into a place for food. Um, but it really is pretty gorgeous. So I'm gonna end with, with us. That in, in that conversation about the future, it looks to me, and I think Roman would agree that, uh, and, and Dr. Todd and Joe Heinen would agree that the future is in a return to our roots where local, nutritious, real foods are available to, community, to communities. So Ruman's call to action at the end of this book is to pay attention to what you eat and what you purchase. The grocery stores respond to their customers' demands. Um, and one of the things in here is as, as Whole Food shows, this can change an industry. I didn't comment on that. So as consumers, we need to support our preferences, our health, and our ideals with our dollars. Stores like Heinen's and Hearts are leading the way back to a healthy connection with our food. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Don't forget to go and vote today. <laughs>